Hello, good evening. It's News 360 from the News Hub here at Addis Ababa in Accra. I am Paul Shiagbo. And I am Issa Mone. Coming up is the headlines for tonight. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Heaven Insecticide Spray and Coil, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, and Napa Foods. My Life Insurance. Tonight's crucial role of media in COVID-19 fight acknowledged as World Mark's Press Freedom Day. An Afrobarometer survey reveals that 72% of Ghanaians do not see the media as free to report news without government interference. Also in the bulletin, we put the spotlight on health care personnel of intensive care units in the COVID-19 fight. And look at broiler beds, production declines further to less than 5% this year. Coming up in international news, Russia records 10,633 new coronavirus infections in the past 24 hours, the highest day rise since the outbreak began in the country. We have all the details, including sports entertainment, coming up this hour. Let's begin the news right on World Press Freedom Day. And in the fight against coronavirus, accurate information is a life and death issue. The press provides the antidote, verifies scientific, fact-based news and analysis. These were the words of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to mark World Press Freedom Day. World Press Freedom Day, popularly known as World Press Day, is one of the calendar events land organized and promoted by the United Nations, observed annually on May 3. The day is celebrated to raise awareness regarding the importance of his freedom. It is also a day of remembrance for journalists who lost their lives in the line of duty. The theme for the day is journalism without fear or favor. As the world fights against the COVID-19 pandemic, society needs credible information to survive these trying times. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres puts it, as the COVID-19 pandemic spreads, it has also given rise to a second pandemic of misinformation from harmful health advice to wild conspiracy theories. The press provides the antidote, verified scientific fact-based news and analysis. A free press, according to UNESCO, is more critical than ever as this year's commemoration comes at a time when the world is facing a global pandemic by verifying facts and uncovering evidence during crisis. Former U.S. President Benjamin Franklin once said that whoever will overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the fairness of speech. It is for this reason that many have advocated for a free press where governments and other authorities should not have control over the media in order to subdue the freedom of the people. Meanwhile, government has commended journalists in the country as the World Max Press Freedom Day. This year's global liberation is on the theme, Journalism Without Fear or Fever. It focuses on the significant role the press play in the ongoing COVID-19 situation, how their contribution by providing verified information can lead to the prevention of getting infected. A statement issued and signed by Information Minister Kujopongkoma noted that government working closely with the media and other stakeholders in disseminating information and education educating the public as part of the broader COVID-19 government response. And you're on News 360. More on World Press Freedom Day. Former President John Dramani Mahama has praised journalists for not allowing the threat of COVID-19 daunt their undying spirits towards reporting. In a message to the media on the occasion of World Press Freedom Day, the NDC flag bearer urged Ghanaians to demand that government stops paying lip service. 
service to the five information to the right to information act i celebrate the men and women oppressing ghana and across the globe the threat of COVID 19 has not daunted your undying spirits the pandemic has not prevented you from going at great and sometimes risk lengths to bring us the stories you have been at the front line of the fight against the disease we are grateful to our oppressed men and women the former president called for an expansion of the frontiers of press freedom in ghana when the freedom of the press is killed democracy suffers and all other human rights that anchor our dignity as human beings are eroded without freedom our dignity is trampled this that's why with a free press, as much as we need fresh air to breathe. He also expressed concern over Ghana losing its number one position on the World Press from Index in Africa. Three and a half years later, we have slumped seven places in the global ranking and lost the number one spot in Africa to Namibia and Cape Verde. We've unfortunately lost this priceless status that made all of us very proud. This should worry us, not only as journalists and media owners, but all of us as citizens and Ghanaians. Former President John Mahama has asked Ghanaians to condemn the closure of radio stations under the watch of the Akufa led government. Let us condemn the killing of journalists like Ahmed Wali, as well as the harassment of Manasseh Adri and Edward Adeti. Let us rise up and speak against the dictatorial withdrawal of radio frequencies and closure of radio stations by the government of Nana Akufuado. The former president further pointed out that just as the press performs a civic service to all, Guineans also have a civic duty of ensuring to always defend and be ready to fight for the freedom of press. And my colleague Alfred Okanse takes a look at freedom of the press in four African countries. Media worldwide is facing crisis on multiple fronts exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Reporters Without Borders released its 2020 World Press Freedom Index on April 21. The index shows a clear correlation between suppression of media freedom in response to the coronavirus pandemic and a country's ranking in the index. During a training program in Cape Town, South Africa, in February this year, I met Julius Odeke, a journalist in Uganda, who recounted how he was shot while following up on a story to authenticate government claims. In the process of doing my work, I got shot at by the military. Two bullets ripped off my ribcage, and I was taken to hospital for dead. They never expected me to leave. They kept monitoring my, 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 my whereabouts, but they could not find me because I was taken to a different, milita uh, uh, different hospital. Now, when they learned of the health facility where I was admitted to, early in the morning, the military came and surrounded the hospital. But I thank God that what the administration of the hospital did was to sneak me into a maternity ward. So there was no way the military could come searching the maternity ward because the person who was shot at was a man. Uganda maintained its 125th position on the Press Freedom Index. Zimbabwe has improved on its position on the ranking by one, from 127 to 126. But for Chris Chinaka, Editor-in-Chief of ZipFact, Zimbabwe fact-checking platform, more needs to be done to protect journalists. It's a space which uh, has to be fought for all time. I think we're still in the uh, formative uh, stages of our states uh, where almost all rights uh, have been campaigned for, that uh, those rights are not taken for granted. Sierra Leone media is pluralist and independent and community radio stations which reach a significant part of the population broadcast without restriction. For Sierra Leonean journalist Abubakar Kag, more needs to be done. We are relatively free but not totally free. We are still trying to cope with the laws, especially the criminal libel laws. 
Um, we see really how the government committed itself to repeal five of the Public Order Act, which criminalizes this libel. And the, a bill has been sent to the House of Representatives, that's our parliament, to repeal the laws. And we are still waiting on the decision of parliament. But we are operating presently, it's like, uh, operations is like our hands are tied on our backs. I follow up to Namibia, where press freedom has a firm hold in Namibia, Africa's best ranked country on the World Press Freedom Index. A 23rd position out of the 180 countries, Namibia enjoys solid guarantees. Broadcast journalist Sonja Smith agrees. I think we have uh, transparency in terms of information, uh, sharing, and um, our laws um, allow for that. Um, our politicians, people in power, they are actually obliged to give information or provide information to the media. Of course, we have a challenge of uh, the access to information bill that is yet to be tabled in Parliament, um, but uh, that doesn't actually really prohibit um, or censor information in, in, in Namibia. We don't have censorship of stories. Ghana dropped three points in the 2020 Press Freedom Index from 27 to 30. The long-term risk of suppressing press freedoms have been exposed by the pandemic. Transparent reporting is a global necessity. Alfred Okonsi, TV3 News. And an Afrobarometer survey has revealed that 72% of Ghanaians feel the media is not very free or not at all free to report or comment on the news without government interference, even though Ghana recorded the highest increase in support for press freedom in Africa. Now, the survey also indicates that only 2 in 10 representing 19% think the media is somewhat free or completely free to do so. The second lowest perception of media freedom among countries surveyed in 2019. 65% of Ghanaians say the media should have the right to publish any views and ideas without government restrictions. This is a 29 percentage point increase over the sharp dip to 30% in the 2017 survey. Currently, 3 in 10 respondents say the government should have the right to prevent publications it disapproves of, but support for the media's watchdog rule remains high. The report noted that 8 in 10 Ghanaians, that's about 82%, say the media should constantly investigate and report on government mistakes and corruption, a 7 percentage point increase compared to 2014. The Afrobarometer team, led by the Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, interviews 2,400 adult Ghanaians between 16 September and 3rd October 2018. Right, so the executive director of Media Foundation for South Africa, Suleiman Abraima, has joined us on phone. I will speak to him shortly. Good evening to you, Suleiman. Good evening to you, and um, thank you for having me. Right, what I did to speak to you, I know you have been speaking a lot about press freedom. Personally, what do you feel is the amount of freedom around you that enables you to do your work? Well, I think that um, generally the situation in Ghana Mm. Um, isn't isn't bad, mm. even though one would wish that um, it's better than what we currently have. Mm. Um, across the world, there is a, a, an increasing trend of repression, um, and, and it's aimed for West Africa and across Africa. Mm. And unfortunately, at a critical time like this, when the importance of journalists and, and journalism is further heightened, we are seeing um, a rather unfortunate increase in number of abuses against journalists, specifically in relation to their work around the pandemic that we are all um, trying to contend with. Okay, so, okay. Um, not, not as perfect yeah. as um, one would want it, but it's not as terrible here in Ghana. Right, we'll, we'll come to the abuses later, but there's, there's, a, there's a report that Ghana has on the Press Freedom Index by three point from 27th position to the 30th position. What do you think accounted for that? Well, uh, again, it's unfortunate. Um, so this 
this is our worst um, ranking uh, since 2018 when we placed the same uh, thirtieth. And over that period, we had only been improving. And indeed, in 2018, we were number one in Africa and now 24 in the world. Unfortunately, last year we dropped to 27, and this year we dropped to 30. I think the main um, factors accounting for the continuous decline is the whole incidence of, you know, in sin violations against journalists, and most importantly, the fact that when these violations occur, um, state agencies either refuse or fail to appropriately investigate them and bring the papers to book. So increasingly, we are seeing more violence against journalists, and at the same time, we are seeing a growing culture of impunity, which is then enabling people or burdening people to feel that for journalists can do anything against them and nothing will happen. Um, and as they say, violence begets violence. And so uh, and impunity also begets impunity. And I think that as a country, if we would want to get back to our glorious um, moments in terms of press freedom, uh, our state agencies have you know, um, increase their, their work in terms of investigating crime against journalists and punishing perpetrators. And of course, right. the organizations also have a responsibility in ensuring that increasingly they um, educate and the capacity of their staff in terms of knowing the principles and policies around how to keep themselves safe. As mm. you see, no story is worth, you know, the right. life of, of a journalist. We okay. hear about swallow incidents which are still going uh, literally uninvestigated. We know about that several instances. Mm. Indeed, last year on July 2, we did cut like a number of violations that had occurred and um, which nothing had done in terms of investigation mm. and punishing perpetrators. And at that time, we had actually sounded the alarm bells that if we were not careful, this would not happen. Mm. Having said that, I should also say that we have lost it all. Indeed, if you look at the ranking, mm. we, are, we are placed higher than countries like the, even the U.S. That has a much more consolidated democracy and, you know, an environment that literally supports um, freedoms, including need freedoms. So, yes, it's not the best as we wish, and we would not do negative bench, benchmarking. Right. We would always try to compare ourselves to the best, and so we do have work to do. Right. Uh, Slebana, you know, Deutsche Welle in Germany has honored journalists who, who face persecution and were abused during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. But let's look at the long-term picture. How has the long-term risk of suppressing press freedom been exposed by this coronavirus pandemic? Well, uh, I think that what we are seeing um, is a reflection of the two um, situations at national levels across Africa and West Africa, that matter. What this means is that there was just a veneer that, you know, um, government pretended to have tolerance for press freedom, tolerance for the current media, and tolerance for the watchdog role of the media. And once the opportunity came that they could now implement measures, policies, and pieces of legislation that would truly show that their attitude was um, freedom and being accountable to the people, they, they have really demonstrated that that is not something that they have um, to do. And so across the continent, everywhere you look at, it's either you know, uh, security agencies are being empowered, you know, do whatever they do against journalists. We are witnessing journalists being arrested, attacked, equipment destroyed, all in the name of maintaining public order around the disease. In Nigeria, for example, laws have been introduced on infectious diseases uh, legislation and, and how states must respond. And we've seen increasing number of, you know, incidents of arrest of journalists on the basis of application of such a law. And I thought, as I said, it's just a reflection of the true um, conduct and true nature of governments around the continent and in fact, in many places around the world, when it comes to whether or not they support press freedom and freedom of expression, also they support you know, critical reporting that holds them accountable to the people. So I don't think that it should discourage us or it should dissuade. We need to continue to do what journalism must do, which is 
holding public, I mean, uh, holding public officials and duty belts accountable in the interest of accountability, transparency, and the well-being of all citizens. So, Suleiman, finally, I mean, in the in the in the era of fake news, how do you measure real quality of press freedom we have? Well, it's a, it's a very, very important issue. Um, and that is why, for example, organizations such as ours, we've um, scaled up a, a small project that we were doing on, on, on countering um, fake news to the extent that over the last um, one month, we have had to recruit more additional fact-checkers. And now we have partnered with the House of the Country to jointly work on countering the issue of fake news. I think that sometimes it's a question of capacity, whether the media have the capacity to be able to thoroughly investigate and put issues that they come across. And it's also about the fact that sometimes these events of fake news can be so savvy and presented in ways that if you are not used to it, you may see it quite credible, and then you, you run with it. Um, we all have a responsibility as media support organizations, as media organizations, to, to know that this is what is happening. And as they say, fake news could even go more viral and become more dangerous than the virus itself. Um, there are research works that are ongoing. Pieces of information are being put out there. Advisory notes are being sent about how journalists can ensure that they cover the pandemic and the issues around it whilst making sure that they don't spread misinformation and fake news. So Great. it's only the Year, no one was prepared for this kind of situation. And as we continue to learn, I'm sure that we would share whatever experiences that we are gathering with the media to ensure that the phenomenon of fake news is mitigated. Right. Grateful for your insights. Suleiman O'Brien is the director of Media Foundation for West Africa. And away from press freedom, it's the world where persons who have contracted COVID-19 do not want to end up. But for some with breathing difficulties, they may require admission to the intensive care unit. The following reports the spotlight on healthcare personnel providing critical care to persons who have contracted COVID-19 at the ICU. The intensive care unit ICU is a hospital ward where critical ill patients are treated, the facility with specialized equipment are run by specially trained healthcare staff. Their work could be traumatic and dangerous. Working on a 12-hour shift daily, the healthcare staff have a daunting task in providing care to the critically ill other units. My name is Joanne. My name is Dr. Roxen. Pasha. Kofi Jackson. I am Dr. Obeng. Desmond. The ICU uh, is a place where we manage patients who are severely or who are critically ill. Uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, these are really patients who have severe pneumonia or patients who have complications, systemic complications of COVID-19. Uh, this may include patients who have very severe infections, what we call sepsis or septic shock or uh, patients whose lungs are terribly bad uh, and who are requiring uh, support either on life support machine or patients whose systems, organ systems, have uh, either failed or failing and therefore requiring specific support of those systems. There is the feeling that we have been a part of something to change the outcomes that we have in Ghana. And also, the other feeling whereby now you know you are really at the forefront. I mean, the critical care um, patients, they tend to require interventions that cause the virus to be spread into the open. And so um, you have staff are more at risk. Um, it's very different from someone who is well and walking around. But in the ICU, they are on oxygen or they are intubated. And so all that generates um, aerosols that the staff at risk. For some persons who have contracted COVID-19, breathing difficulties may necessitate an admission to an intensive care unit. 
Kwoshia Anyani works at the pediatric ICU of the Kolobutchen Hospital. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, she's volunteered to cater for the critically ill at the East Municipal Hospital. She's on duty, has to attend to her patients. It's a collect effort here as healthcare workers at the ICU keep an eye on each other to ensure she's wearing her personal protective equipment properly. Being the cover up, patient cannot identify you, so with your name, they can call you by your name. Treatment to support critically ill persons at the ICU include high flow humidified oxygen and intubation which involves inserting a tube through the mouth into the windpipe through which oxygen is delivered via a ventilator. What happens is we come in um, to serve the patient their foods, their medication, we check their sugar, everything that we need to do for them. We don't like this, we come in, we finish then, we move out. We have the first one being an infused so much. It is used to infuse IV fluids. The second one is a monitor to monitor the cardiac readings, the BPs, the heart rates, saturations, temperatures, and the rest. And the next one is the ventilator. The ventilator is the perfuser. That one to mostly used to perfuse drugs, drugs that need to run a period of time. You sometimes you need early monitoring. Sometimes you check a pain sugar, it's very high. You have to intervene immediately. Within the uh, go back and check again. We also look at other, you know, uh, factors that may come in psychological factors, spiritual factors. And we've had occasions where some of us have to, have to pray with our patients to encourage them that it's gonna be okay. Seeing this patient coming critically ill, sang breathless and then taking care of them through their um, initial admission to this stage where they have recovered well. It's a motivation that we are doing a good job. But have we given the Kaizen already? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 4 and 5, 5 milligrams, and then... Uh, Klexen and vitamin C. Porsche shit is now over. How are your patients faring? Oh, let's say they are fine. The first day a patient comes into the ward or into the ICU, our aim is to nurse the patient to go home. Yeah. To motivate you. The joy of seeing a patient in a critical condition and then you being able to nurse the patient, for the patient to be able to be discharged home. In fact, sometimes we jubilate. We actually do cake party to celebrate that yes, our patient is going home. She now has to go through the donning of process of removing her personal protective equipment. I asked members of the team what it feels like working at the ICU, especially when the probability of being infected with the virus is high. One of the things we always ask is that make sure you are fine because we know for fact that there is a risk, a very high risk in this area. Um, so we want to make sure temperatures are okay. We ask. Do you have a sore throat? Are you feeling well? Because at any point in time, you can be infected. Daily I think about it. And every time I get a feeling in truth, or I feel like feeling, I try to hold back. I, 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 I think about it. Why well, am I starting to have symptoms now? Am I positive now? If you don't do it, who else do you expect to do it? My main motive being here is I'm doing this for my country and for God. So I'm just I'm motivated by saving life and seeing patients recover. For nursing, it's all, all about uh, helping the patient and also nursing the person to a peaceful death. So if the person is going to die anyway, you still have to give the proper care to the person goes. Some of them are very cool. We discuss how they recover, what they have to do, and they are all very friendly. It could be depressing when a patient dies under their care. When we lose any one of them, that's a big blow to us. It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter how ill they came. It doesn't matter how old they are. Um, we, we really feel it. And for persons who contracted COVID-19, this is the best way to say thank you to the healthcare workers who dedicate their time to take care of them. And reporting.
on the novel coronavirus comes with its peculiar challenges and joins the rest of the world to mark press freedom day we throw the spotlight on some journalists here at tv3 who have been on the front line breaking the news of the pandemic journalists have to provide their viewers and listeners accurate and up to the minute information on covid 19. Here at Media General, the newsroom is mindful of their role in this important global assignment. Posh Gabo has been practicing as a journalist for 13 years. For her, though changing, someone definitely has to tell the story. When the outbreak of COVID happened in Ghana, the first story that I did focused on someone who had contracted COVID-19 that had recovered. At that time, you just get... Um, government officials and health officials talking about persons that had recovered but no one had seen them and i wanted to move beyond the statistic to telling the story about someone that had recovered but how has reporting on covid 19 been like after you do the story and you come back and you 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 feel that tingly feeling in your throat you are wondering hey could this be covid and then you checking up on your cameraman or then when your temperature goes up a bit, you are just nervous, so and then it has that psychological impact. And every day, I keep checking myself out to ensure that I don't have COVID 19. Having went on a wide range of social and health stories, she tells me she finds joy in bringing up issues which affect people. But one thing she wants urgently addressed, particularly on COVID 19 reporting, is stigma. You get people calling you COVID report, and when you come back, from assignment, everyone just wants to keep a distance from you because you've gone, you're just arriving from a treatment center. And I understand my colleagues as well, I understand the public as well. Sometimes you get text messages, what the heck do you, did you think you were doing going to a treatment center? Are you thinking about your family? Are you thinking about your children? I have all these in mind, but someone has to definitely tell the story. Joseph Armstrong has been working as a roving journalist for eight years. He has been at the front line, reporting from open markets, communities, and some health facilities. If a journalist do not go there to report, I mean, who who, who, who has that uh, courage to go there? That, this is our job. This is what we've been trained to do. I have this much joy stepping out there to report on such uh, issues because I, I feel that the people in the uh, rural communities, if we do not go out there to report, how do they get educated? You understand? So for me, it is my joy for me going out there to uh, make such a That doesn't mean that I, I, I am untouchable. I cannot be infected also by the virus. He tells me his most challenging setback on COVID-19 reporting is when officials are not forthcoming with the right information. Well, the challenge I have is the fact that you go out there to do a story and meet a public official or a security personnel and you speak to them before you start the interviewing they give you all the information you need the real truth but once you lift your microphone you start interviewing them they divert from an entire issue and they start saying things that they know very well deep down in their heart they are not speaking the truth the port health officers that were placed at our various borders before we even recorded our first covid 19 case in this country they were placed there, they know they didn't have PPE, they didn't have the test kits. Yet, when you get there, they tell you, oh, we are prepared. We are scanning everybody. Yet, right in front of you, you see people crossing without being scanned. One of his greatest fears was when he joined some health workers on a bus ride to some health facilities. Yeah, I remember uh, one time I did uh, bus riding with some of the frontline uh, workers uh, from Kolibu. And at this point, people that work at the ICU and other uh, places or departments within the hospital set setup, I have to ride with them and find out how their work is going. And then I got in the, I mean, before I stepped into the bus, I mean, I, I was a little scared because these are people that are yet to go and then have themselves washed down. And uh, my interacting with them, holding the same metals they are holding. And I know very well these are people that have come into close contact with the uh, COVID patients. And uh, that day, I was scared. 
as the world acknowledges the work and impact of healthcare professionals, similar attention must be given to journalists. AC Benewa Otu, TV3, Accra. In other news, the local poultry industry is on the verge of collapse. Locally, production of boiler beds has declined either from nearly 60% in 2000 to less than 5% in 2020. At the same time, imports have shot up from 13,900 metric tons to over 155,000 metric tons over the period. Eben Ikumbuatin has more in this report. Chief Executive Officer Ken Thompson and Director of Operations Joe Jackson, both at Dilex Finance, summed up the state of the poultry industry in Ghana. Something as simple as poultry, something as simple as egg production. Who is now talking about increasing that production? The supply chain has been broken. Can you imagine the number of jobs that will be created that way? The cheapest protein in this country is chicken, and we import the chicken. We have to start producing them locally. Locally, and we have the ability to produce locally and this solution ensures that not only are we getting jobs for our people not only are we creating the the demand but we are ensuring our food security according to the ministry of food and agriculture ghana's poultry meat demand out to 400,000 metric tons per year domestic production stands at around 57,870 metric tons ghana imports 300,000 metric tons of chin annually at a cost of $374 million. This translates into 5 million chicken production weekly. National Vice Chairman of Ghana National Association of Poultry Farmers, Napoleon Ajemai Odru, says the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the situation, but optimistic and the need to take advantage of the situation. Everything cannot be all right overnight. We need to put our ideas together to see where we need the necessary investment to be able to produce the chicken need in the country. And if uh, policymakers and come together, we think we can tap into the opportunities that appeal. The Ghana National Association of Poultry Farmers believe they can supply the country's needs. I believe if we come to the table to discuss all these, Ghanaian poultry producers can really fulfill the the, the, the claim of the hundred percent production of chicken as we used to in the 80s. But why have they not been able to scale up production? Napoleon Ajain Odru indicated the need for massive investment in the poultry value chain. We have to do such an investment into processing because the quantity of chicken we're talking about, you can defer them with hands. We need to use machines and equipment to the processing developing the country's poultry industry along the poultry value chain will ensure that production farms input suppliers hatcheries feed mills veterinary service producers process marketers cold store operators and consumers all play their roles efficiently to ensure Ghana's self-sufficiency in poultry meat production now management of media general group says it recognizes that the practice of homosexuality is illegal in Ghana and will therefore not act in any way that contravenes the laws of the public. In a statement, the management said unequivocally that neither media general group nor the host of the day show use the show to endorse or support or promote the practice of homosexuality in Ghana. It said the episode focused on educating the viewing public on whether the behavior or lifestyle of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community is as a result of some underlying medical and psychological factors. To that end, the producers invited ESP for Stanane Water, a clinical psychologist of the Ghana Police Hospital, as a guest to enrich the show and to help educate the viewing public on the subject. His role was to give medical and psychological explanations to these behaviors whether or not it could be classified as mental disability or attributed to biological or hormonal factors. ESP Nanewato further gave clinical advice to the guests on the show who narrated their stories. So the statement further said a section of its cherished view 
viewing public and social media misinterpreted the content of this week's edition of the day show aired on TV3 on Saturday, May 2, 2020. Management says Medical Media General, as a law-abiding company, prides itself in giving its cherished viewers well thought out and educative content at all times, which vision and responsibility are not take, taken lightly or, or for granted. Watching News 360 and we will return shortly with some more. Mission supported by the Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. The construction of two single-story dormitory blocks at the Drobonso Community School in the Setra Farm Plains District of the Ashanti region is progressing steadily. The community in high school built under the tenure of former president John Mahama has been converted into a boarding facility. The Drobonsu Community Day Senior High School was part of second cycle schools constructed by the S. Well John Mahama administration to expand access to secondary education in Ghana. However, most of the schools constructed are yet to take in students three years after its completion. At Drobonsu in the Setra Afram Plains district of the Ashanti region, the school had not been occupied because of its location about seven kilometers from main township. Students in order in order to access the school, would have to trek long distances. When TV3 Mission visited the community in November last year, the district chief executive of Setra Framlanes promised work on the dormitory block would commence. In February this year, TV3 Mission returned to the project site. Work is currently ongoing for the construction of a two-story boys and girls dormitory at the Drobonsu Community Day Senior High School. When completed, the Community Day Senior High School will be converted into a boarding facility. Your first story on the Senior High School and why it's still not paint uh, brought a lot of light to what has happened to those uh, legacy E block. And uh, from your coverage, a lot of people showed interest in knowing what is happening with the e-block and the concept of the community day. This government and the Excellency Nanado Danko Ekufu was benevolent enough to recommend to the Minister for Education to vary the day community for Sierra Farm Plains to a boarding facility. The facility is expected to increase enrollment in senior high schools by students who complete junior high school in the district. The construction of the two three boys and girls dormitory is expected to be completed by September 2020 to admit the first intake of students. We are strongly pushing for the contractor to hurry the work up so that we can have the boys and girls dormitories in place and the minor ancillaries to go with it to ready the school for intake in September. So hopefully September all things be in the core. The original intended community day e block SHS for drop on so community and by extension such a farm plains see light of day. But it won't be a day school as it was originally intended under the previous administration. And as it for mission mission is supported by the Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK aid and the EU. Right, here's more news on News 360 tonight. And some churches say telecasting and online streaming of services are draining their finances. They fear if the coronavirus is not contained, it will be difficult for them to continue, adding that some employees may also have to be laid off. Since the ban on public gathering, which included church services, Services. Most religious groups have resorted to other means to reach their members. Some churches either stream online or buy radio and television airtime. The practice, according to some of the religious leaders, is a drain on their finances. This definitely has a die effect on the church. Uh, either to 
could congregate as ecclesial community. And with that also, we have somewhat of a revenue stream to run the institution so far as the church is concerned. But here is the case that we are not able to congregate as such. And so it definitely has its own financial consequences on the church. Whatever raises we have, whatever we have in our coffers during this moment is here towards a vulnerable society. Um, especially in this trying moment when people are struggling to get something to eat, to drink, to lay. How many churches can afford in, for example, 3,000 Ghana cities for one hour broadcast of four, 10 minutes broadcast? Only few churches can afford that. And for those that can afford itself, it's putting a financial stress on them. Because the church is not only about broadcasting either on Facebook or traditional media. The church has other responsibilities. Prophet Agaspa Kwame Donko of the Grace Assemblies of God Church at Kwadasu in Surum said a prolonged COVID-19 may affect the activities. There's a much more problem no, to this time. Uh, all in a in 500 Ghana city. From March up to now, many we have collected for offering and tithe do not add up to 500 cities. I'm afraid if it continues like this, some churches may lay off workers. So, as sorry as I can cry, I want to know that CCR or more as me for a Ketriani, one or more for more to take a more electricity bills, Kakakra, Eba. Many churches have now put together a team and with the help of a digital media expert, they are now investing in the technology. And why not? Because there is a lot of pressure on them in these trying times as many people are looking up to them for results. It's now time for Sports News with Thierry Nyan. Hello, good evening, and it's time for us to bring you the latest in the world of sports. My name is Theory, and let's get into the details. During the coronavirus pandemic, football clubs have one mission, to ensure their players will stay in good physical condition and be ready for the time when the game resumes. But it, it is a difficult task at home that footballers could do other. So we spoke to Waffle Operations Manager, Giorgio Fusuhine, who explained how they carried out the task. The technical team, uh, uh, they are in contact with all the players and they have a, a common platform that uh, while they are home, they ask them individual trainings for them to do it while they are home so that it, it will keep them uh, in shape before the league. You don't know when, but you have to be always ready when, you know, I, I think and then I'm very sure that in, even when if a league to start again or resume again, you make sure it will be maybe two weeks to one month that they will announce to us for us to prepare. But before then, I think individually, they are some individual players what they to do, what they are doing while they are home, and some of them even as even uh, they can send their videos back to their technical team. So I think we are in, we are still monitoring them what they are doing while they are home. All right, now let's move on. And former Arsenal and German winger Lukas Podolski says he has no plans for coaching after retiring from uh, football. The World Cup winner reiterated the idea of venturing in business rather than remaining on the hot seat of any club as coach. I don't know. I have uh, one half year contract yes. here, and uh, I think I have some some more year left because I feel good. Uh, and my head is clear and my head is, is fresh. Yes. Uh, and when everything going to connect together, yeah, I can play, I think, two, three, four, me four more years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I know I don't ca can come back to Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but let's see. I don't know. And after football, I don't have any plans yeah. for now. Uh, you know I have a lot of business running yeah. in, in Germany. And uh, maybe, of course, of that. But. How So that is it from uh, your former Arsenal, uh, you know, winning uh, Lukas Podolski. But German kit manufacturers Puma are closing in on a record-breaking £100 million deal to sign Manchester City and England winger Raheem Sterling. That definitely will be mouth-watering. Now, these...
The uh, Premier League has present deal with Nike runs out in less than eight weeks. And rival brands including Under Armour, uh, Adidas and New Balance have been pursuing Sterling's signature for more than two years. If the deal goes through, Sterling could collaborate on the development of a sportswear range with American rapper Jay-Z, who doubles up as Puma's creative director. The England winger is no stranger to the Puma brand, which already has a 10-year, £650 million deal as Manchester City's kit supplies. On that note, we'll bring an end to the sport here on 360. My name is Thierry and thanks for watching. Versatile Kumawood actor and preacher man Bishop Bernard Nyako has died. Reports indicate the popular actor who gave up the ghost on Saturday night battled an unknown illness for months. Joseph also arrived reports his colleague actors have been paying tributes to him. To a state of shock, disbelief, and mourning following the death of seasoned actor Bishop Bernard Nyako. In 2019, the actor was struck by an unknown ailment which took him off the screens. He later had an operation to correct the condition. The news of versatile actor's demise went viral Saturday evening, May 2, 2020. Many movie enthusiasts and celebrities, including his colleague Kuma Wood actors, have been mourning their friend and brother. Renowned actress Messi Esiedu couldn't control her tears when the news reached her. <laughs> Yao Dabo was equally shocked and wept uncontrollably after hearing the news. Through a Facebook post, popular actor Joe Inkansan Lowin mourned his colleague with a message that read, Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Ow, Bishop Bernard Nyakon, father of all, we are in a queue of death. God, forgive us all. May the Lord keep your soul in a perfect place. R.I.P. Bishop Aga Kweku Menu wrote. Vivian Jill wrote, My heart is broken. Rest in peace, Bernard. Reacting to the news, actress Nama Mac Brown said they had made several efforts to visit their colleague at the hospital but all proved futile as the actor made several excuses as to why they should wait for the right time. The top actor battled a short illness in 2019 but recovered in early 2020. Bishop Bernard Nakon later announced his decision to put acting on hold and concentrate on winning souls, Christ. <laughs> The actor recounted how his own friends and colleagues in the movie industry plotted against him even though they were very close to him. Bishop Bernard Nyakon, a favorite actor, was admired by many for his originality, creativity and for his perfect blend of Chi and English language in movies. The cause of his death remains unknown. May his soul rest in perfect peace. There are some friends immediately will tell them, say, many problem, I'm prayer. Full friend on February, you go and say, the next thing you are going to talk about is money. Money. Yeah, I'm a Ah. And my meaning will not be born, sir. The P. May his soul rest in perfect peace. And that will do for this edition of News 360, which came to you live. From Addison, we're here in Accra. I'm Mr. And I am Boshia Gabo. Coming up is Day to Rush.